Welcome to another episode of The Brand Called You, a podcast and podcast show that brings you leadership lessons, knowledge, experience, and wisdom from hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. I am your host, Ashutosh Garg, and today I'm privileged to welcome a very, very accomplished businessman, a fellow IPO member from Ghana, Mr. Yao Bene, Bene Amponsa. Yao, welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, Yao is the Managing Director of Merson Capital Limited, which is involved in project development consulting and venture capital investments. And as I mentioned, he's in Ghana. Uh, Yao sits on several boards uh, in and around the world, and uh, he's a member of the YPO. So Yao, let's talk about Merson Capital. Tell me about this venture. Um, uh, Merson Capital is the holding company for, it's the parent company for a number of businesses. Uh Primarily, uh, we started as a consulting firm, Mm -hmm. financial consulting in the infrastructure space. Mm -hmm. Uh, We've done quite a bit of work in energy, uh, healthcare, um, and, you know, Mm -hmm. agribusiness, financial services. And in the past, when we've done uh, consulting work and we made a bit of money, we had to find something to do with it. Mm-hmm. So sometimes we would take equity stakes in the businesses that we consulted for, mm-hmm. or other times we found profitable opportunities mm-hmm. that we then originated and invested our money in. It. <laughs> Over the last year, we scaled down our business a bit. Mm-hmm. We stopped the consulting. So now we are mostly in construction, property development, mm-hmm. financial services, and HR management. Mm-hmm. That's what we do. Fantastic. And uh, as you have been building your businesses, and uh, you, you mentioned you scaled it down, probably because of the pandemic, what have been some of your challenges and some of your learnings? Um. The the challenges primarily relate to um, people having people in the right positions, mm-hmm. right skill sets. Uh, we made some uh, being a developing country. Sometimes mm-hmm. the appropriate skill set is not always available; it has mm-hmm. to be trained. Right, and sometimes we made the wrong sort of appointments. Mm-hmm. Um, other times. We've seen opportunities and we've underestimated the challenge okay. of realizing that opportunity. Mm-hmm. So we've not planned appropriately. And um, I would say one more challenge is um, maybe we've not capitalized the business as adequately as we should. Okay. And, and we found that we've not committed enough resources. Amazing. Those are the three main things. Amazing. And one more question uh, uh, you know, from your perspective as Merson Capital, how is the startup ecosystem in Ghana? Um, there isn't a formal ecosystem per se. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of startups, like anywhere else in the world, yeah. really, mm-hmm. will start with the individual's resources. Some uh, love money. Mm-hmm. So money from loved ones, parents, brothers, mm-hmm. sisters, mm-hmm. friends. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, the difference between Ghana and other places is that when you've used that money, the seed money, mm-hmm. in more developed jurisdictions, the, there is a formal maybe angel investor network Correct. or venture capital network that you can tap into for funding to take you to the next stage. Mm-hmm. Um we are now developing that ecosystem in Ghana. It's only now that we there is some nascent um, investor network that you can tap into, but it's very difficult. Mm-hmm. It, so most startups need to be cash flow positive re- re- relatively quickly mm-hmm. and then bootstrap to the point where bigger investors can come in. Very interesting. Yeah. And uh, talking a little bit about uh, Ghana, uh, We used to see a lot of advertisements being run in India about uh, the the Ghana Ghana economy and inviting businessmen. What are some of the things Ghana is doing right uh, in terms of uh, building such a powerful economy? It is seen as one of the most progressive countries of Africa. Um, 
yes, the Ghanaian economy has grown by um, more than 10 times in, mm -hmm. since the year 2000. Mm -hmm. And I think it's mostly down to one political stability mm -hmm. and also better, you know, we now have a better, uh, let's say, um, continually improving mm -hmm. um, judicial system mm -hmm. that protects uh, property rights. And so people are more and more confident because we've come from a history Mm -hmm. of uh, military interventions mm -hmm. where you know you could be asked to justify even legitimately acquired property mm -hmm. but with uh, with our recent history of political stability and the judiciary uh, being exerting uh, their authority over you know matters of adjudication mm -hmm. people are now more confident to go out and do what they can to make something of themselves, mm -hmm. knowing that their rights to whatever they create is mm -hmm. protected. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that respect for rule of law uh, is also helping us uh, in a way, because even when we have foreign investors come in, they come into Ghana knowing that they'll be fine. Mm -hmm. you know, nobody's going to take away their businesses or anything. Mm -hmm. So we become a friendly jurisdiction mm -hmm. for capital, whether it's local capital or foreign capital uh, as well. And um, we have, uh, well, not compared to India, but we have a somewhat large population of yeah. 30, 31 million people. Mm -hmm. And so that is a viable market, mm -hmm. you know, maybe not necessarily for the most luxurious of goods, but... Mm -hmm. We have a growing middle class right. that is viable. And mm -hmm. so it's a market that any producer can tap into as mm -hmm. well. And relatively good infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we've invested heavily in infrastructure. In yeah, you know, I've been, I've been reading here a lot about mm -hmm. uh, Ghana. And, uh, you know, the country seems to be not just growing. It's got great infrastructure. You know, a lot of natural exports, yeah. are, natural product exports are taking place. Mm -hmm. The government is inviting investors to come in. I think it seems to be doing all the right things. Uh, we're, we're trying. We have our problems. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and that's why we're a third world country. <laughs> <laughs> but but we, are, we are trying, uh, making genuine attempts to solve the problems. Mm -hmm. Um, sometimes we take a, a few steps backwards, but um, the long-term trend is that we are moving forward. And, and that gives everybody confidence to commit to, to whatever we're doing. Amazing, yeah. amazing. So again, now coming back to, uh, you know, startups, and I'm sure you must be investing money in startups um, and you're building your own. Uh, Based on your experience, what are some of the mistakes a lot of startup entrepreneurs make? Um, the, to be an entrepreneur, uh, one basic trait is that you need to be optimistic. Okay. If you're not optimistic about tomorrow, mm. you're not going to invest today, mm. defer your gratification and say, let me sow today and reap tomorrow. Mm. Uh, but sometimes... The optimism is too much and, you know, you have blind spots. Correct. And so um, we sometimes underestimate the risk mm -hmm. that we are taking on. Um, sometimes you find entrepreneurs also underestimate the complexity of what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. Because um, every successful business basically is set up to solve a problem. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes the solution to that problem mm -hmm. may involve complexity beyond the capability of one organization or one person, mm -hmm. because it may be a systemic problem that you're trying to solve, mm -hmm. uh, even though it's disguised as, you know, um, a, an opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, and we find that sometimes people also start businesses without a clear idea of how to monetize mm. the solution that they've created. Mm. So um, the, these things, these are things that every entrepreneur needs to understand clearly 
Right. And even if it's not a matter for today, have a roadmap mm. towards the, the solution for tomorrow. Right. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, even in our own case, uh, sometimes we underestimate the funding required mm. as well. Mm. So the idea may be brilliant, but the, the, the funding is inadequate. So you're one of the questions that is often asked uh, by a lot of startup entrepreneurs is should they bootstrap their startup for a long time or should they raise money whenever they get it? I'd love to get your perspective. Um, it's, it's, it's a question that must be answered in context. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're fortunate to have a startup that's throwing off cash very quickly, mm-hmm. then you have the uh, ability to bootstrap because you can acquire all the resources that you need mm-hmm. to grow. If the runway towards profitability and, and being cash flow positive is a mm-hmm. bit longer, mm-hmm. then you need external funding to help you stay alive until you reach the point where you're cash flow positive. Okay. So in, in cash flow terms, it depends on whether you have, whether the business is generating cash or not. Mm-hmm. So that's the first thing. However, um, sometimes you also need external validation. Mm -hmm. And so even if you're throwing off cash and you know, um, when, when liquidity covers a lot of mistakes. Mm -hmm. So even if you're throwing off cash, it may be a good idea to take some cash out of the business for yourself to secure that cash Mm -hmm. and get external funding. Mm. Because and, and get it from a strategic investor mm. because that investor coming in mm. may look at the business with a fresh perspective Correct. and realize where perhaps some risks are actualizing mm-hmm. and could hurt you down the road. Mm. And so, you know, that um, may be useful that even though you're getting some cash from the business, mm. it may be a good thing to bring in another person uh, to help you and to assess mm. where you are and the path that you're on. Mm. <clears throat> However, one of the key reasons why a young business may require external capital mm-hmm. may simply be know-how, mm-hmm. right? And, and not just, let's say, let me give an example. Say you're a young food and beverage business Mm -hmm. and you've acquired a significant market share in your local market, however you define it, in -hmm. your city, in your suburb, in your municipality, in your country. Mm -hmm. But there are prospects to grow and distribute beyond your local market. Mm -hmm. Then it may make sense to allow a Diageo or SAB Miller or, you know, some Mm-hmm. bigger firm that's interested mm-hmm. to come in so you can leverage their existing distribution network mm-hmm. and grow the business beyond what you could organically do mm-hmm. in, a, in a reasonable uh, uh, space of time. Correct. And if they are coming in, it may be good for to allow them to deploy some capital as well mm-hmm. so that your interests are more closely aligned. So this is not a question that can be answered either way. I except in, in a specific context. Oh, absolutely right. Well said. So uh, my next question to you, you know, and uh, you also make venture capital investments. Um, I wanted to understand from you, what are some of the key metrics you look for before you make an investment? Um, well, the first thing is, is it an area that we understand? Mm-hmm. You know, it's not, there are lots of um potentially profitable economic sectors that we do not understand. And if we don't, then you can't judge the risk. And so, you know, you can't really go in Mm -hmm. uh, unless you're going out to acquire uh, skills that would enable you to understand. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you can't go chasing everything. So Mm -hmm. if it's outside of our areas of uh, sectors of focus, Mm -hmm. then we, we leave it alone. Um, size of investment. Now, because we don't have a fund, mm-hmm. um, 
whatever our liquidity is at mm -hmm. any stage, mm -hmm. that's what determines what we can do. Okay. So we may see a good opportunity, but you know, it may be too big for us. Mm -hmm. And if it's not something that lends itself to bringing in others, mm -hmm. clubbing together, then we may let it go because it may be too big to digest. Mm -hmm. And then also um, uh, the time to profitability. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in Ghana, macroeconomic environment can be a bit volatile. Mm -hmm. So when, when we're investing, even though we always stay in, we are perpetual investors. We don't go and exit in two or three years or whatever, but we need to be sure that the business will stand on its own two feet very quickly. Okay. Um, and then impact, mm -hmm. you know, is there a purpose to it? Very interesting. Uh, and uh, at what stage or how long do you stay in, in, a, in, a, in an investment? And when do you look for an exit? Now nah, we 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 stay in long term. Okay. We we only look to exit an investment if um, it has seriously deviated from what we expected it to be. Um, uh, otherwise, when we commit, we commit long term. Interesting. And uh, you know, whenever I speak to someone who invests money, I always love to ask them, "Tell me about the ones that got away." Uh, I'm sure you've got some where you think you should have invested. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, a lot, a lot. Um, about 10 years ago, um, that was the start of the uh, private pensions industry. Mm -hmm. Before then, we had one state-run uh, pension um, monopoly. Mm -hmm. and, and then we changed and said, let's have some uh, private pensions as well. And we had an opportunity to invest in one or two. Uh, we then take it up for various reasons. At the time, we were too focused on infrastructure. <laughs> and um, we think we should have put some money into mm. that space. Okay. So, and, and it's grown phenomenally. And, uh, and what makes it a little painful is that it's not as if we didn't know mm. that the sector would grow. We knew. Uh, we just, um, so that demonstrates that making the right decision is not just about having information. Mm. We had all the information and we still made the wrong decision. <laughs> well said. <laughs> so, uh, Yao, I've got time for a few more questions and my uh, viewers and listeners love to get to know my guest a little better. So I've got time for three, four questions for you personally. My first okay. question is that, you know, as a businessman, <coughs> successful, doing well, as you look back, what are some of the three key milestones or pivot points in your life or your career so far? Um, so... Um, when when I was um, when I was in school mm -hmm. um, uh, in university, mm -hmm. the uh, we had to stay home for one year because the professors were on strike, mm -hmm. um, and um, in that one year, uh, instead of just staying home, I decided to get a job. I I intended it to be just a paid internship mm -hmm. so I could get some money in my pocket. Right, um, but I ended up getting a proper job mm -hmm. uh, as an HR officer mm -hmm. in a mining services firm. Mm -hmm. And uh, that exposed me mm -hmm. to the world of work mm -hmm. in, a, in a more serious way. Mm -hmm. um, sorry. Um, so I learned the norms and ethics of, you know, um, turning up to work, delivering to timelines, uh, all of those things. And um, I think that helped me a lot and also got me into mining. Um, and after that, for 10 years, after school, for 10 mm. years, I was CFO of a mining services firm. Oh, wow. Um, and in, in that time, mm. I also had got the opportunity to be part of a group that listed 
two mining opportunities mm -hmm. on international stock exchanges. Okay. Um, so that I set up the companies, we acquired some gold concessions and we put the companies on the Australian Stock Exchange. Mm -hmm. And that started my entrepreneurship journey, mm -hmm. being an owner of a business and, you know, putting money to work and risking your money in the, in the hope of a return. Mm -hmm. So that was also an important milestone. Yeah. And then um, the, the third was uh, founding Mason Capital mm -hmm. because I no longer earn the salary it's okay to earn a salary and, yeah. you know, double in a few things on the side, but, you know, setting up messing capital and leaving my previous job, mm. committing myself to it and um, uh, hoping to create value for myself mm. and my employees that uh, and community because community is an important thing. Fascinating. So those are the three. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, my next question is that what are some of the core values you believe in? Um, community mm -hmm. is important. Um, the more prosperous a community is, mm -hmm. the greater the opportunities for all the members of that community. Correct. And so um, it's not just about individual success. Mm -hmm. um, it, to be truly successful, all the people that you work with mm. also have to share that success. Mm. And beyond them, you need to have a real impact on the on the community that you operate in. Mm. So that that's important. Um, having so um, uh, one of my mentors uh, advised me when I was starting out mm. that. I should be careful what I'm known for. Mm -hmm. what you, because what you're known for, that's what people pay you for. Mm. And so if you're known to be competent in your profession, mm -hmm. and you're known to be honest and a man of integrity, mm. then people are going to pay you for that. Right? Mm. Uh, so money is a byproduct mm. of who you really are, mm. what people know you for. Mm. And um, this is not just about popularity. Or, um, I guess it's what you refer to as a brand. Mm. Uh, authentically, Correct. who you are well and said. the value that you yield to other people. Mm. So, um, yeah, I try to be authentic, authentically useful. To, be, <laughs> to people around me. What a great, what um, a great comment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and family. Family is important. And family, of course. I agree completely. Yeah. And my last question to you, and this is for the many, many young people who will listen to our conversation. What would your advice be to a young individual starting off on her or his journey, either in the corporate world or as an entrepreneur? <clears throat> um. I think it goes back to what I just said. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of young people uh, initially start out thinking, what am I getting mm -hmm. from this opportunity? Mm -hmm. But what you're getting mm -hmm. will depend on what you're contributing. Mm -hmm. So the first thing is to understand whatever you're engaged in, mm -hmm. your role in the organization, if you're mm -hmm. a young employee, you say, okay, this position that I'm being hired for, mm. why does the organization need someone in that role? Mm. And what do I bring to it? What extra value can I add? Mm -hmm. And once you keep doing that, mm. you're going to earn the value that you deserve, mm. whether from the immediate opportunity or someone gets to know what you're doing and you earn the value by being offered another role. Mm. But Whatever you're doing, you need to understand it and work to make sure you're making a real contribution to that particular, that specific opportunity, mm -hmm. to the other stakeholders in that opportunity, mm -hmm. and to the community beyond. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's important. 
How wonderful. Yeah, on that note, uh, thank you so much for speaking to me. Thank you for talking to me You're about welcome. Merson Capital, about your philosophy for investments, about startups, and finally, about your own self and uh, some of your own journey. Thank you again and good luck. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank Enjoy you. the rest of your day. Thank you for listening to the brand called You Videocast and Podcast platform that brings you knowledge, experience and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website www.tbcy.in to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Just search for the brand called you.